Wi-Fi 37? I don't know. It's like a Harvard thing. Oh, okay. So most of like all the the, the non-extension courses they start. I think it's because they stack the classes here so that one class will get out at 5:30 and the other one starts at 5:30. Oh, yeah. So it's like an informal transition time. And so. No, we usually start close on time, but she usually waits until four minutes to four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and if there's not enough people, yeah, she'll wait. Cool. So you guys are all aspiring grad students, is that? Cool. Oh, that's one less one. What are your guys' interests? Uh, I'm hoping to do clinical. It's like PhD. That's rough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's like so little chance about it, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> well, you're in a good spot to be training for it, so. And you? I'm interested in research and topics that related to cognition, learning. Cool. That's so what I do. Oh, that's cool. Cool. Yeah. Forensic psychopathy? Yeah. <laughs> I've always had an interest in, I mean, like, since the age of, like, I'm off it sounds like nine in, like, which is where Christelle's from. And I told them that I was giving the lecture in case they wanted to see um, sort of broad overview of, we're covering the same stuff today, it's just we're covering in two hours what they do in semester and a half. So. Nice, I got friendly faces in the yeah, crowd. Yeah, the real superstars of your class, huh? Yeah. Yep. It's funny, I realized after I mentioned it, I'm like, I hope they don't think this is like brownie points for extra credit or something. It's just like, that's why I put the line email, like, seriously don't come if you're not interested. You don't get extra credit for coming. This is just if you want to see. I remember in high school getting extra credit for things like that. Yeah, exactly. Three points on your next test and show up. Yeah. Luckily, your grades are all fake anyway, so yeah. it doesn't really matter. Ken was telling me about a student of his who just got tenure at Northwestern, who when he was a grad student failed stats on T53 times. Oh, yeah. Ooh. He didn't get to take, yeah, he failed it three times in a row. And I mentioned, he's like, listen, just, just pass it the next day. It's getting embarrassing for me. Yeah, that's a good way to get yourself kicked out of the program, actually. I'm working on such a superstar of research. Yeah, that's the year, the year before, um, the cohort before me, there was a guy that got kicked out, and it was, I mean, that was the primary reason, was he, like, couldn't pass any of the stats classes. And yeah, I mean, I'm on time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is good. I mean, the fact, like, it, you, you got to nail this stuff down, because the next, and not only that, but the next class gets way hard. That this one is easier than that one? The thing with Sedanius is an absolutely brilliant. We're listening to, well, no, right. Ariana, and then there's like five guys there, and also sit there. Well, wait, there's Ariana, and then the girl got. Anyway, so hopefully, if there's more people. Um,
they'll come in. If not, the slides are online. The slides are on the course website, right? I sent them to her this morning. Sorry, um, they got there kind of late. I touched them up last night, so um, they weren't quite ready. Um, so, basic, so first off, I'm Kyle Thomas. Um, I'm a third year PhD student here in the program. Um, I'm currently the TA, it's called TF, but no one else knows what that means unless you're here, um, for the stats class, for the Harvard grad stats class. Um, and I've tutored statistics for a really long time. And this is basically the overview that I think people should take out of more or less undergrad. Um, it's, it goes further than that. I get into multiple regression even. I don't know if we'll get all the way through it. I have enough slides that we could go forever. Um, my goal is to get you through multiple regression. We'll see if we get there. Um, the other thing is I'm standing up here at the front just because of the arrangement here in the room. But I really encourage it to be interactive. If something I say isn't clear, let me know. Um, also, the, we're going to start going through just a whole bunch of definitional stuff that I hate to just lay a bunch of definitions on you, but they're important conceptually as well because they really define the sort of landscape of what we're doing. Um, so we need to lay down a, a, a sort of foundation in which to understand the statistics. So the first half is what are samples, populations, descriptive statistics, just sort of broad sort of overview so that we can get into the stats. Um, the second half is a bunch of different statistical tests. Um, it's hard to do stats without being somewhat technical. I tried to make it as non-technical as possible. Um, well, that's not totally true. I tried to make it very comprehensible, at least. Um, I do have equations in there. I don't necessarily expect you guys to know, and I don't want you to sort of shut down. Some people, when they see math equations, they shut down. I'm going to walk you through all of them to show you what they're doing. Um, and some of them are more complicated than you need to know, but I just put them up there so that you understand sort of what the math is doing. You don't need to know what all the terms are. You don't need to know sort of, you know, oh, this term goes there, and you're summing the variance or anything like that. I just want you to get a sense of what each of these statistical techniques does. And by the way, I know this stuff at a much deeper level than we're going to go into here. But even when I'm doing my own research, I'm not usually thinking about all the deeper level stuff. This is about the level that I'm thinking about it at. And this is the level probably I think that most people are thinking about it at. So if there's any confusion, if some weird term comes up that you're not sure about, please interrupt me. Um, also, it is presented in a fairly linear way, but it can't all be linear because there's things that have to be introduced before they're, you know, they're defined, before they're introduced, or vice versa. I'll try and connect all the pieces. So I'll try and say, you know, this is a term that's going to come up later. Um, but let me know if there's some weird thing in there. Um, and I try to italicize or underline anything I think is important. So. All right. Um, also, yeah, slides are online. So if you want, I try to design the slides so that they can sort of stand on their own. They need some explanation, but you don't need to worry about desperately scrolling notes on all of these. It's more important, I think, that you get the gist of it because you have the notes online. Um, and I'm not 100% sure, you know, since it's not my class, how all the details like that work out. But that would be my suggestion. And mainly what I want you guys to take out of this is just a basic understanding of what you're doing with statistics, what the logic is, why we use statistics, and when you're reading a paper, what they're doing. Why they did it that way and not some other way, and what you can actually infer from what they did. Does that make sense? Cool. OK. Um, also, let me know if I'm going too fast, too slow, whatever. Um, all right. So the very first thing that we need to talk about, and that really sort of starts off um, all statistics, is the difference between populations and samples. Um, I'm sure a number of you guys probably know this from undergrad, if you've done stats as an undergrad. Population is just an entire collection of relevant people or events. You can uh, define a population however you want. Um, importantly, it's just that it includes every single aspect of it, every single example of it. So for example, you could have everyone in the United States, everyone in this class, everyone with some sort of specific disorder. It doesn't really matter. Um, all that matters in terms of how you define the population is what types of questions you want to ask or what your theory says or something along those lines. Um, parameters are measures of populations. And I have Greek in parentheses there because parameters are usually represented with Greek variables. So if you see a variable in Greek, it's a parameter, meaning it's representing something about a population. If you see it in the Roman alphabet and our alphabet, it's representing a sample. Okay, so that's one way to help distinguish those and help keep them straight. And that's standard throughout the field. There's not a whole lot of standard notation in statistics. 
This is one thing that's fairly standard, is that parameters are going to be in Greek. And when I say measures of populations, basically what I mean there is just, it's a way of sort of summarizing the data. For example, the mean of a population, the standard deviation of a population, what's the modal response, stuff like that. Um, a sample is just some subset of an entire collection, right? It's just some subset of your population. Um, and this is really, really important because understanding whether you're working with populations or samples really dictates what you're going to be doing. For example, you would never need inferential statistics for population. Maybe I shouldn't say never, but there's not a single example I could think of where you would need inferential statistics. And we're going to get into that, but it's just fine to use the descriptives and say, here's the mean of the population. These two populations are different or aren't different. Um, inferentials are for when you're jumping from a sample to a population. We're going to get into that here a little bit more. Um, samples would be something like some Americans rather than everyone, one class out of an entire high school, some people with a disorder. Pretty clear, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I know this is basic. I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. Sorry, can you explain the difference between everyone in the class under the population and then one class in high school? Sure. School? It, de it depends on how you define your population. Okay. So if you're, if you're interested in how people in this class do, how are you going to do on your final? That would be the entire population. If you're interested in how well do people in this whole high school do compared to other high schools, but you only looked at one class, that would be a sample. Thanks. So yeah, and it always depends on how you define it. It's not, there's not some sort of population that exists in the world. It's based on how you sort of cluster things together. Um, so statistics are measures calculated from samples. So parameters and statistics are basically the same thing. I mean, statistics encompasses a lot more. But the technical term statistics, if someone refers to a statistic, they're talking about something that came out of a sample as opposed to a parameter. So the mean of a population, the average IQ of all Americans, is a parameter. The mean of a sample, the average IQ of just the people in this room out of all Americans, is a statistic. Does that make sense? And you can always tell the notation because they use Roman letters, which is our alphabet. So, is that clear? Again, I know this is kind of basic, but it's going to be helpful because here's where we're going to go. So here's a broad overview of what you do in social science research in general. Um, basically, you have some population up here, the big circle, but typically in social science research, you can't measure the whole population. You can't go right now and get IQs, IQ scores for all American citizens, <coughs> mainly because people are going to be being born, people are going to die, it would be impossible. Not to mention incredibly expensive, right? So just practical limitations, usually what we do is you apply some sort of a sampling technique to draw out some subset of that population. There's different ways you can do this. For example, polls try and get representative samples. They try and make sure that they have each group well represented in the subset from the population. Um, usually as researchers when we're sampling, we try and do random sampling so that you're not introducing any bias. You're not picking some weird subset of the population. You're picking something that sort of represents um, what it is. You take your sample, you characterize it using statistics, you get the mean, standard deviations, you get some sense of what these samples look like. It's all you can really measure. And then you use your, your sample and statistics to draw inferences, make estimates, and more or less what you generally <coughs> want to know about is the population. And you use statistics to get there from a sample. Does that make sense? So if we could just get the whole population, we wouldn't have to know all the statistics stuff that we're going to go through. You could just talk about the population and describe it. Say, here's what the population looks like. Here's what's happening. However, because we generally can't do that, we have to use a sample. And then all this complicated stuff that comes around here on the bottom is all the stuff we're going to talk about today. Inferential statistics, basically, how do you make claims about populations when all you can look at is samples? Does that make sense? Sort of broad overview of what we do. Um, Again, sort of just laying basic groundwork here. There's two types of variables. You've got independent variables. Um, independent variables are the variable that is manipulated experimentally or pseudo-experimentally. Um, in the first case, experimentally, you could give someone a drug versus a placebo. That would be an independent variable. Or pseudo-experimentally, you could look at gender. Obviously, you can't randomly assign people to different genders. That's already a class that exists in the world. So that would be a pseudo-experimental independent variable. So you can't manipulate it yourself. But the basic idea here is these are the things that are differentiating things and the way you break groups up and what you're manipulating when you're doing experiments. Dependent variable, um, often called the outcome variable, is the variable that you're measuring to observe whatever hypothesized effect it is that you're using. <coughs> Test scores, anxiety levels, happiness, you name it. These are all going to be dependent variables. Um, there you go. I just, I guess I jumped in on that one. Again, makes sense. I think you guys are all pretty familiar with this stuff. Um, Okay, 
types of measurement. So this is actually a part that I've noticed um, from tutoring that in undergrad statistics is often sort of not emphasized enough, I guess I would say. They mention it in undergrad statistics, but it's actually incredibly important in research design and in methodology. And the main reason this is so important is because how you measure something impacts what kind of analysis you can do. So if I ask you, do you like this, and I let you answer on a yes or no scale, you're not going to be able to run the same kinds of statistics that you could if I ask you, how much do you like this, and let you answer on a one to seven scale. So this is sort of the first thing, the first level that you want to hit statistics at is, what level am I measuring my variables at? And if you're involved in research design, you want to think about this before you run the research. I've gotten data sets before where they didn't think about this before they ran the research, and they're incredibly difficult to analyze. It's clunky, it's not pretty, you just, this is really important and you need to think about it before you actually run your research. Um, oh, by the way, these, these variables are all hierarchical. So any variable, the next one down, <coughs> could be basically represented as the one that came before it. It could include it, but the reverse isn't true. So for example, I could make that one to seven scale variable, the same as a yes, no, just break it in the middle and say, oh, there's two groups, there's the yes group and the no group, but I couldn't go the other way. I couldn't take the yes, no variable and make it on a one to seven scale. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the first type is nominal variables, uh, where nominal means name, right? Comes from the root name. Um, and these are just basically variables that are measured as categories, right? So ethnicity, gender, location, yes, no responses, um, all of these would be nominal variables. The next level up, you've got ordinal variables. Now, ordinal variables are ranked variables. Um, they're variables that can be ranked in some meaningful way. But importantly, what differentiates these from the next two types that we're going to talk about is that the gaps between the values are uneven. Let me illustrate a little bit what I mean by that, and then we'll come back to it here as we get to the next um, types of measurement. Um, imagine you have a race, and you have first place finishes in two hours, second place finishes in two hours and 10 minutes, and third place finishes two hours, 10 minutes, and two seconds. <coughs> right, so first was way out in front of second and third. An ordinal variable, you would just know first, second, and third. Even though second and third are almost the same, yet first is very different, right? Does that make sense? That's what defines an ordinal variable. So if you want to know if it's ordinal or if it's higher, you just need to ask, are the gaps between the, the different values, are they all going to be even, right? Does that make sense? OK. Samples of this would be ranking in a race. Also class rank, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, you could think of as a, as a ranked variable. Um, and this is really important to have these two on one slide and have the other two on the other slide, because if these are the only types of variables that you have, you have to use non-parametric tests, which again, some of you are probably familiar with. We're going to come back to that here later in the slides. But non-parametric tests are awesome in some ways. They can do all kinds of wonderful things, but you lose a lot of statistical power, which means if you're doing research, you have to increase the number of subjects that you're using. Right? Does that make sense? So you sort of want to avoid these guys. That's not, you know, that's a rough and dirty sort of synopsis, but you more or less want to avoid these guys in your dependent variables. We're going to come back to that. If, they're, if your independent variables are nominal, gender, whatever, that's totally fine. If your dependent variables are nominal, it sort of boxes you in a corner in, types of what, in terms of what types of statistics you can actually do on your data. How is it? It's too fast, too slow? Good? Cool. OK, so types of measurement. These are the variables you like. These are what you want your dependent variables to be measured on. Um, first is an interval scale. And these are just variables measured numerically where the distance between the points is equal. In the social sciences, for the most part, this is the highest level that our variables get to. So in general, you don't have to think about the next one. Interval is sort of the highest level. It doesn't really matter the next one. Um, I introduce it just because it's sort of textbook to introduce it. And it, there, there is one important difference. For the most part, just think about interval variables um, as what you want for your dependent variable. These would include things like seven point scales, how much you like something on a scale of one to seven. Um, we sort of assume that it's interval, right? Clearly it may not be, but that's an assumption that we generally make. Um, Fahrenheit temperatures, for example, the difference between two degrees and three degrees is the same as the difference between three degrees and four degrees. Um, and the next type is called ratio scale. These are basically, they're the same thing as an interval variable, but they have a meaningful zero point. Meaning that a zero on, on whatever it is that you're measuring has some meaning that's not arbitrary. Right, like on a seven point scale, you could imagine you could go like zero to six. In zero, it's not really meaningful. 
right? When someone's like, oh, I'm not really interested in it, right? Or I think that's really bad. There's nothing sort of anchoring that into the world in a meaningful way. Does that make sense when I say that? Good examples, oh, the reason it's important is because the ratio scale, it allows statements like subject A to twice as well as subject B. So for example, if you're answering how much you like something on a one to seven scale, and let's say I like it and I rate it a two and you rate it a four, it's not really meaningful to say you like it twice as much as me. Right, that sounds kind of silly if you think about it. Um, but with ratio scale variables, you actually can say that. Good examples of this would be GPA, right? If I get a 4.0 and you get a 2.0, in some sense you could say my GPA is twice your GPA. Because there's a meaningful zero point, that means you just failed that entirely, <coughs> right? Another good example, and this is sort of subtle, is Kelvin temperature. So I don't know how much you guys know about scales of temperature. Fahrenheit temperature, zero is just the freezing point of water. That's just an arbitrary set point, right? So when they invented it, they just said, or I'm sorry, freezing point of water is 32, I'm going Celsius. But they just basically arbitrarily set that somewhere, right? However, with Kelvin temperature, it's actually defined in terms of molecular energy. And zero on a Kelvin scale is when all molecular movement stops. So that has a very sort of rich meaning in the physical world. So on the Kelvin scale, you could say something that's four degrees Kelvin is twice as warm as something that's two degrees Kelvin because there's twice as much molecular motion. I think it doesn't quite break down like that, but roughly that conveys the idea, I think. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Again, in general, in social science, you can just sort of collapse these. We don't usually make claims like, they did twice as well, right? Um, and also, the, the statistics are the same form in general. Most importantly, you want to measure your dependent variable on one of these levels, because then you can do parametric statistics. We're going to get into parametric statistics. That's the majority of what we're going to be talking about. Um, parametric statistics are sort of the standard for social science. T-tests, Z-tests, ANOVAs, all of these, they're parametrics. They're very powerful, they're very good, um, but it's really important to think about this because if you don't measure your, your dependent variable on one of these levels, you can't run parametrics. You're stuck only with non-parametrics. However, the reverse isn't true. If you wanted to run non-parametrics with these variables, you could convert them into the other ones, you would just lose some information. You wouldn't generally want to do that, but you could. Make sense? Okay, so distributions and parametric statistics. So a distribution is just some collection of scores, right? Like all the test scores from the class. Um, again, you guys are probably fairly familiar with this. Parametric statistics assume a normal distribution, right? Everyone, again, is probably familiar with the normal distribution. Um, I do want to mention, though, that people get real hung up on normal distributions. Um, we do in our stats class a little bit is, is normality violated? What does that mean for our stats? <coughs> um, in some sense, normality will always be violated. And the reason for this is that the normal distribution is just a mathematical abstraction. It's derived from calculus. It never actually exists in the world in the same way that a perfect circle doesn't actually exist in the world. But it's a useful idea of idealization, right? Just because an, a, an absolutely perfect circle doesn't exist doesn't mean it's not helpful, for example, to use the diameter of a bike tire to figure out how far you went or something like that. Um, it's close enough and it approximates it. And in general, we like our variables and their distributions to approximate normal. Um, but in general, parametric statistics are pretty robust to violations of that as well. So it's not totally necessary, but you should be aware, and you'll hear that, that they assume a normal distribution. Um, but even if your data end up being fairly non-normal, depending on how bad the violation is, it may not matter. So this is the normal distribution. The reason why it's so helpful is because, well, you, you guys it's not the best picture. It looks something like this. It's a bell curve. Um, the reason why it's so helpful to use this abstraction is that we know where things lie in the distribution. For example, we know that at the far tail up at this end, you've got 2% you know, of scores above some value. We know that below that, you have 98% of the other scores. And this is what allows us to make a lot of the inferences that we're going to make with inferential statistics. So it's an assumption. It's an approximation. It allows us to make inferences that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Or at least it would be incredibly complicated to do otherwise. You need calculus to derive these distributions, all this other stuff. Um, so it's sort of like a, a hedge, right? Helps us out. It's a productive assumption, but it's never exactly going to be true. Make sense? All right. So now we finally get into actual statistics. So descriptive statistics, it's pretty straightforward. Um, mathematicians and scientists are very logical and reasonable and boring. Um, descriptive statistics are just statistics that describe distributions, right? Really straightforward. Um, exactly what it says it is. 
Basically, the, the goal of descriptive statistics is to take, say, some huge list of numbers and summarize it so it's easily digestible. It's really hard to look at 100 test scores and know a whole lot about what's going on. It's a lot easier to look at the mean of those test scores, right? These are descriptive statistics. They help us describe distributions. Um, there's two major kinds that we deal with. There's a lot more, but there's two major ones that we deal with um, in social sciences especially. The first is measures of central tendency. Basically, what's the sort of representative element from the sample? Um, there's different ways you can measure this. One is the mean, which is the average of a sample. Notice here I'm starting to use the notation. You've got x bar. The bar means average. X means it comes from some domain X. It's a whole bunch of scores, a whole bunch of X scores. Um, or a population, notice it's a mu, right? Greek letter, um, same thing. If you see mu, that's the mean of a population. If you see X bar, that's the mean of a sample. And that's fairly standard again in the field. Um, we're going to come back to this. I just want to mention right here while we're on it, that the mean of a population is typically the best guess for any given score in that population. Right? So if you knew nothing else, you knew some population was more or less normally distributed, you didn't know anything else about the population, and I told you I'm going to pick a score out of that population, I want you to guess what you think that score is going to be. In general, your best guess is going to be the mean. It's not always true. If the distribution is funky, it may not be true. But generally speaking, your best guess without any further information is the mean. When I say best guess, what I mean is on average, you're going to have the least amount of error. Does that make sense? Okay. Similarly, the mean of a sample is the best guess for the mean of the population it comes from. So let's say you don't know the average IQ of Americans. You take some subset you think is a representative sample. You find out the mean of that sample is 100. Your best guess for the mean of the population is also 100. Right? Does that make sense? It's called the maximum likelihood estimate. Um, again, I mention this now because it's going to come up later when we start to get deeper into the actual inferential statistics. It becomes important. The median is just the value that divides the distribution into two equal size pieces. So if you take every single number, you line them up. You take the middle one, or if there's two middle ones, because there's an even number, you divide them in half. Right? Makes sense. Again, probably familiar with that. Mo is just the most common number in distribution. Um, importantly, if you go back to the normal distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode are all the same. When the mean, the median, and the mode are not the same, you have various types of violations of normality. Right? Like if you have a big skewed distribution, your median and your, and your mean are going to be quite separate. Is that a hard, fast rule? That if, I mean, if, you, if they're off just by a little bitty bit, that you can say they're not normal? If they're off, it's not normal. But it depends on, right, since, excuse me, since nothing's ever actually normal, right. it depends on sort of how big that difference is. OK. OK. So the second major type of descriptive statistics that you're probably familiar with um, already, but we're going to go over, is measures of dispersion. Measures of dispersion is just how spread out the data are. Right? So I could tell you the mean, but you could have a mean of 100 and not be spread out at all. So everyone's either at 101 or 102, somewhere in that range, or it could be hugely spread out. The mean could be 100, but a lot of scores are at 50, a lot of them are at 200, you just don't know. Right? So dispersion tells us sort of how spread out the curve is. Um, the first measure of dispersion, it's not the most conceptually transparent one, but the most conceptually transparent one is derived from this. I'm going to introduce it first, and we're going to come back. Um, variance is just a measure of how spread out scores are in a distribution. This is the formula for it right here. And you'll notice what you're doing is you're taking each individual score x. You're subtracting it from the mean. So you're looking at how far off of the mean is every single score. So if it, you get 102 and the mean is 100, that difference is going to be 2, right? And then you square them all and you sum them all together, right? So you take all of these distances, you square them, and then you sum them, and then you divide by the number of scores that you see in the population, right? Or the number of scores that you're summing over. Um, the square root of that is the standard deviation. Standard deviation is a lot more conceptually transparent. And you should think of the standard deviation more or less as the average amount that scores vary from the mean. That's not a technically rigorous definition, um, but conceptually, that's basically what it is, right? On average, scores are about 10 off. So if I were to guess the mean, on average, I would be 10 off. That's one way to sort of think about it. It's not um, as precise, maybe, as it could be. Um, but that's the easiest way to sort of deal with these. Um, 
Same deviation, just square root of variance. So you just take that thing you have up above and you square root it. Right? One way of thinking about this is you squared it to get rid of the sign so that negatives became positive, and then you square root it to get back to where you started, right? Square it, you get rid of the sign, square root it, you're back to the value you originally had. And then you're dividing by n, which if you think about it, the mean is just all the scores added up divided by the number of scores, right? This is roughly all the different scores added up divided by the number of them, right? Sort of like the average amount that they're going to vary. Yeah? So the larger your standard deviation, does that mean that there's a problem with the data? Or? That's a good question. It depends. It depends. Um, Basically, all that means is that it's more spread out. It could be a problem. For example, if you had a flat distribution, that would be a pretty bad violation of normality that would actually affect our statistics. And you'd expect a bigger standard deviation then than if it was a normal distribution. So there aren't hard and fast rules where you can say anything sort of concretely and generally about that. But it would be something you might want to worry about if it was unexpectedly huge. Um, and there are big problems in some of the inferential statistics. We're not going to get into it today. Um, but just make you aware of it if you have samples that have different variances. So you're trying to compare two samples and one variance is massive and the other is very small. It causes a lot of problems with inferential statistics. So it's a good question. All right, everyone's on board. I know, again, I know this is probably a lot of review for you guys, but. I have a question. Sure. Why do we use the um, location for the population when, in fact, we always calculate for the um, just for the Sample. The sample, yeah. Like, like you already use the population equation when you actually never work with the population Right, right. That's a, that's a great question. We're going to come back to that. Actually, that's a fantastic question. The reason I have it here in terms of population is because it's the clearest, easiest way to think about it. And we want to know about the population. So as we start moving away from it, as we're sampling and doing these other things, essentially we're going to keep coming back and trying to estimate this value. Okay. So when we calculate it for a sample, the formula is slightly different than that. And the reason is what you're trying to do in the same way that the mean of the sample is the best estimate for the population, the, pop the, the sample standard deviation calculated for a sample, which is slightly different, is your best estimate for the population standard deviation. Right. But the population standard deviation is much more transparent what's going on. Does that answer the question? Yes. Cool. And that's, by the way, um, that's how we're going to frame as we build up through the statistics. Essentially, you're just going to know less and less about your population. So you're going to start off knowing all these wonderful things about the population, and I'm going to keep pulling away pieces of information. And the statistics change because we have to keep estimating different pieces. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. We'll, we'll come back to that. That's a great question, though. Um, okay. Inferential statistics. So these are the two major classes. That you have descriptives, where you're basically just describing things. If you're dealing with a population, you just use descriptive statistics. You can just say, we know what the mean of that class was. We know what their standard deviation was. We know what the mean of that class was and their standard deviation, and you can just see that they're different. You don't need to do anything else. You can just look and say, we know they're different. You can see it. We have everyone there. You can, you can just look at it, right? However, if you're trying to compare samples or compare samples to populations, you need to use inferential statistics. And what inferential statistics do is more or less just give you faith that observed differences that you see are robust, that they actually would generalize. So let's say you pull two samples that are different, right? You can see that their means are different. But the real question you want to know is, are the populations that you pulled these samples from different, right? And what the inferentials allow you to do is say, how robust is that difference I see in the samples in terms of the populations themselves? Does that make sense? So we're all sort of thinking about descriptives. And inferentials just give us sort of the, the, the spine to the descriptives for our samples. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Um, these are used when someone wants to do more than just describe something, right? Because they're inferential. They're used to make inferences about populations from samples. Again, very straightforward mathematical wording. I love math and science because you can not know the answer and you can make a guess and you're usually right because they name it exactly what it is. Um, so inferential statistics are just about making inferences about populations from samples. More or less the process I was just discussing. The populations can be real. All Harvard students, all the people in this classroom, those are real defined populations. We could count them. We could say, oh, there's 2,003 of them, right? Or they can be hypothetical. For example, all depressed people that take Prozac, right? If you were to try and define that population, even if you could sort of freeze the world, you'd be hard-pressed to do it, right? 
you, you have these sort of weird fuzzy boundaries of this person's kind of depressed, but not really depressed. Do I stick them in that group? Do I stick them in this group? Importantly, it doesn't matter for the statistics, but it does matter conceptually in terms of how you think about it. That they can be hypothetical populations, that's not a problem. They don't actually have to exist somewhere around the world, right? I know it's a little bit abstract probably right now, but we're going to come back to that um, because it's really important for the basic logic of how inferential statistics work. But they don't have to be real populations. Um, usually in research, we want to know about populations, but we can only measure samples, going back to that second slide. Right? All we can do is take a sample out. We've got finite time and resources. Sometimes it's just impossible. Sometimes the population itself isn't very well defined, like I was just saying. Um, so we take samples, we measure samples, and inferential statistics tell us if what we observe about the samples actually generalizes to these populations that we're pulling them from. Because right? you can imagine you could have some population, and you could pull two samples out of it, and they could be indistinguishable. Right? But just by random sampling error, you're going to get differences. You're always going to get differences. And what inferential statistics allows to do is say whether or not those differences are meaningful at the higher level. Right? Does that make sense? OK. All right, here's where it starts to get complicated. This is probably the most hated topic in all of statistics for all social science uh, students. We're going to kind of breeze through it. I want to make sure that the basic logic is laid out. Um, it's fairly complicated, and it leads null hypothesis testing is what leads to a lot of misunderstandings in statistics because it's this sort of inverted backwards logic. And the reason it's an inverted backwards logic is because of the way the statistics force us to ask questions. We're going to come back to that, and I'm going to map the two onto each other, but I just need to make sure that everyone's familiar with this. Have you guys been introduced to null hypothesis testing before? Define the null, define the alternative. Is everyone at least vaguely familiar with it? OK. Um, I'm going to go through it once more. I feel like every statistics class should probably spend a lot of time going over this, because people get very confused. Um, usually in research, we're testing some sort of hypothesis about how groups relate to each other. We'll come back to that. In essence, I would, I'm trying to think of a counterexample. Almost all social science hypotheses, and maybe not econ, at least in psychology, can be brought back to this right here. Are these groups different or are they the same? Now, that's not usually how we ask the question, but that's the mechanics of the thing. That's what we're actually asking. OK, so um, to do this, we've got to use null hypothesis statistical testing. The question that it allows us to ask is, Say you know some population. You know the IQ of all Americans or whatever, and you want to know, is this particular high school super overachiever or something? But you only get some of the students out, right? What it allows you to ask is, what is the probability that the sample that I just pulled was drawn from this known population? Right? That's all that we can really do with statistics. That's an overstatement. That, at a first pass, that's all we can do with statistics. Right? Is ask, what's the probability that this group that I just pulled came from this population? Or alternatively, if you don't know the population, what's the probability that these two samples that I just pulled out came from one single population as opposed to, say, two populations? We're going to come back to this. I can see a couple of you looking around kind of funny. We're going to come back to this. It has to do with how statistics work, because all the statistics allow you to do is say, these two groups look like they came from different populations, or these two groups look like they came from the same population. Or, Better stated, we don't have enough evidence to say that these two came from different populations. Right? We'll come back to it. So if it's a low probability that they came from the same population, we assume that they came from different populations, right? or that maybe there's a meaningful difference between the groups. This is what your p-value is, by the way. Your p-value is the probability that the samples you pulled came from the same population. Or if you knew a population and you pulled a sample from it, what the probability is that that sample came from your known population. Can a broad way that you think about it just be that when you're doing the statistics, like, you have to, you can't assume anything. Like, you just have to come and assume like nothing's there, don't make any assumptions, and like that's the de facto position. And so you get these two samples and you're like, is there any, like, I'm trying, is there any possible way these are from just like the same big population? Just like, no, there's no way. 
like the probability is so low. Right. And that's so, like, the p value is so small because like even though I'm trying to find a way to make it so that these are from one population, it's just it's just not happening. They have to be different. That's a great way of putting it. So rephrasing that with a sort of concrete example, let's say you wanted to know does Prozac help treat depression, right? The way I'm sure you are all familiar with, the way you would test that is you would get a control group and you'd give them, you know, lemon drops or red hots or something, you give them some sort of sugar pill, and then you give the other group uh, Prozac, right? And then you look at these two groups, and of course their means are going to be different. Even if Prozac had zero effect, you know their means are going to be different. But we sort of start out assuming, as Michael was pointing out, that let's just assume there was zero effect. If there's zero effect of Prozac, then they're identical, right? I would have pulled them from the same population, the population of depressed people, right? Does that make sense? So we start off assuming that, and then we run our statistics and say, wow, that assumption seems really improbable. In fact, I would say there's less than a 5% chance that I pulled both of these samples from one population, right? So if that's really, really improbable, that they would have come from one population, what's the most likely explanation? That they came from two populations, right? Population of depressed people without Prozac and a population of depressed people with Prozac, right? Another way of interpreting that is that Prozac has some effect on depression. Does that make sense? And that's how this sort of structural logic maps onto the conceptual logic of the actual hypothesis testing that we're doing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's walk through it one more time. Um, we're going to have to keep cruising along. Largely, I knew this was. I, I knew there was a problem that we might get bogged down in this. And like I said, it's it's logically sort of tricky. It's like doing mental aerobics um, logically to understand this. But it's really really important because this is sort of the structure that our statistics map onto. So let's say you have one hypothetical group of people, right? Let's say depressed people. Right, and you want to know something about some way of treating depression, right? One way of framing such an idea is that there's actually two populations that sort of exist hypothetically in the world. One of these populations is depressed people, and one of these populations is depressed people who take Prozac or some other medication, right? Because they're different from each other, which is why they're two populations. If Prozac had zero effect, they would be the same population. Does that make sense? Okay. Problem is, we can't actually measure those populations. Right? For one thing, they don't really exist. They're just sort of in our minds. So instead, what we do is we pull two groups of depressed people. We give one of them Prozac, and we give one of them the placebo. And then we look at it. And when you look at these samples, right, you can see that the samples are different. Those people that took Prozac are actually less depressed than those that didn't in the sample. Right? You can measure that. The mean is higher on some happiness in index or something like that. right? So you can look at your samples and say, well, the samples are different, right? But we didn't want to know about our samples. We do know about them. We know all that we need to know about them, right? What we really want to know about is the populations or the hypothetical populations that they came from, right? The real question we want to know is, are there two populations in the world? One of depressed people without Prozac and one of depressed people with Prozac, right? Our samples are different, but we need to be able to figure out, are the populations different? The only way you can actually accomplish this using parametric statistics, using these sort of standard <laughs> statistical measures, is by starting off with the assumption that they're the same, that there are not two populations in the world. There's only one. And this includes both depressed people and depressed people who are taking Prozac, because they're the same. right? So we start off with this assumption. That assumption is your null hypothesis. right? And essentially, what you're testing is, What's the probability that my null hypothesis is true? That there is only one population in the world, right? And if you were to pull a sample from, say, the far tail end of this hypothetical distribution, 
that would be really, really unlikely, right? It seems much more likely than that you probably pulled it from a different distribution, a different population, right? So you start off by saying, let's assume we pulled both our control, our control group and our, our, and our Prozac group from one population. In other words, Prozac has zero effect, right? We assume that. We run statistics on it, and our, our statistics say the probability of that just happening, that you pulled both of those samples from one population, is really small. Let's say it's 0.05, right? There's only a 5% chance that that could have happened. Well, if it's really unlikely that we pulled them from one population, we're then safe to assume, to some extent, I shouldn't say safe to assume, but we then assume that there must be two populations in the world because it's so unlikely that we would have pulled them from one. Does that make sense? Yeah? And that logic maps onto if there's two populations in the world, then Prozac must be having some effect. Okay, cool. It's, it's worth rewalking through though because it's complicated and it also impacts how you actually do all the statistics, what the statistics mean, how you do research design. I mean, this underlays a ton of stuff that we do and it's kind of tricky, right? So and then you're kind of, yeah. you, you are in a sense, right? You're defining this population of depressed people with your control group that you gave a placebo to, right? And we're gonna come to that with the statistics that essentially if you didn't know what the population was, you need a control group to estimate what it was. Right. Does that make sense? And then you compare your experimental group and say what's the probability those came from the same group? Does that make sense? Yes. Cool, okay, any other questions? Cool, I think we'll cruise through this thing because I think that pretty much covered the rest of the well, hypothesis stuff. Usually in research, we want to know if two groups are the same. Some manipulation has an effect, etc. This is our research hypothesis that group A is not the same as group B. Notice those are parameters, right? So we're talking about populations here. My hypothesis is depressed people and depressed people that take Prozac are different in some way. That's all it's saying is that they're just not the same. Their means are different. One's happier than the other, I don't know, right? However, these questions have to be mapped onto the statistical logic of populations and samples. The statistics sort of constrain the way that we can ask this question and the way that we can analyze this question, which is why we have to go through this convoluted logic of null hypothesis testing, right? So if the drug does have an effect, these groups would represent two different populations because they're different on our measure, right? This is perfect. This walks through even sort of once more. Conversely, if the drug has no effect, then people that take that drug and those that do not only form one population because they're not different, right? They're the same, right? Okay, so that's sort of the conceptual research question and now we're gonna go into the statistical side of that and they map right onto each other. Um, so in order to test if our research hypothesis is true, we must compare it to a null hypothesis which is different. Null hypothesis statistically defined is that all samples come from one population or that the mean of one equals the mean of the other, right? The null hypothesis conceptually defined is that the groups are not different, there's no effect of your drug, whatever. Basically, whatever it is, it didn't work, right? Your experimental um, manipulation didn't work. Does that make sense? Okay, importantly, this is not the same as saying that the research hypothesis is false. All that you can say is we don't have enough evidence to say that our null is unlikely, but that doesn't the flip of that isn't true. That doesn't then mean that your null hypothesis is likely. It might be, it might not be. You can't actually answer that question. So arguing the null in research is actually very, very difficult because of this. So if you want to say, maybe people say, oh, men and women are different on this measure, right? And you want to say, no, they're not. That's actually a hard way to do research because the statistics make it very difficult to make that type of argument. There are ways to do it, but it's complicated and it's difficult and you got to do some tricky stats. You need big sample sizes. It's it's complex. It's just important to realize that what the statistics tell us is the probability of getting samples from a given population, from the same population. What it doesn't tell us is what's the probability that our hypothesis is true. And people often mistake that. Yeah. I just, I want to make sure that I'm following this. Before, so let's give you the Prozac example. Before you give the experimental your assumption is that those two groups do come from the same population? Yes. Okay. I'm fine. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. So, in order to do this, first we set up our null hypothesis. Mean of population one is going to be equal to the mean of population two. 
And our research hypothesis, the mean of population one is not going to be equal to the mean of population two. All we can test here is the null hypothesis. We can't actually test the research hypothesis. We assume the research hypothesis if our null hypothesis seems sufficiently unlikely. Right? I think I'm sort of hammering that one in. That, okay. We can never say whether a research hypothesis is true. Again, you can't ever prove anything in science. I mean, this is sort of a deeper philosophical fact. Karl Popper, famous philosopher of science, basically argued it's impossible to ever prove any hypothesis. We can only argue it's our best explanation for a given data. Right? I can't prove to you that the sun exists. It's impossible. All I can say is that's the most likely explanation given the fact that we all see it every day, et cetera. Right? Sort of just basic logic. Um, statistically, you can never 100% say that two samples come from different populations if you don't actually know the population distributions. If you did know a population distribution, and you knew, let's say, the highest score was 110, and you pulled a sample that had a mean of 120, you could actually say, we know it didn't come from that population. But in general, you're not in that type of a situation when you're doing research. So you can't ever say, all you can say is it was really unlikely. You can't say it couldn't have happened. That's, right? that's exactly what I was thinking about when I asked it, because I thought like, two samples can be so different from the population. And if you infer the, um, the population from the sample, then you can't really say that it was not. They are or are not. Right. And you can't, you can't ever say that. But I mean, you have this problem in all of science, really. <laughs> So here we have a specific statistical problem about, oh, it's a probabilistic statement about, you know, it's unlikely that this could have occurred or something like that. Um, you kind of have that problem in all of science. Um, this is just a specific instantiation of that problem, right? You can't really prove anything ever in science. All you can do is say, all the evidence we have points to this, right? Sure, it may be false. And in fact, that's what Einstein did to Newton, right? He's like, oh, no, your theory is wrong. There's a different way of thinking about it, right? But even now, Einstein could be disproven. You can't ever prove it. You can only disprove it. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. OK. So we can only evaluate how likely a null hypothesis is to be true with inferential statistics. So there you go. This lays the sort of foundations for where we're going from here. How are you guys doing? You guys want a break? You guys doing all right? This is a natural break, because I just went through all the conceptual stuff. And now we're going to hit actual math and statistics. Yeah, quick break. Are you guys good? No? OK. I didn't, didn't hear yes, so we'll, we'll keep moving here. OK. So by the way, all these slides are on your course website. Might be worthwhile working back through them. Um, also, clearly, I don't have a ton of time. I've got two hours to go through about a semester and a half of statistics. So I'm truncating these. And some of the statements that I'm making are you know, 98, 99% correct to sort of first pass. We're not quite there, because I don't have time to go into all the rigor of all of this. Um, but any good methods book, any good statistics book, I'm pretty sure Wikipedia has a great treatment of this. It's really important if you want to go into social science research that you understand null hypothesis testing. It sets the stage for basically all research design. And it's not totally true. There are things you can do without doing null hypothesis testing. But this is the vast majority of what you'll do. And understanding the logic of it will make you a better researcher. Not like that, but if you're reading other people's articles, people will make claims a lot of times that totally violate this logic. Um, it's better now. More recent articles, I think, tend to not do this so much, but they'll, they'll, you'll catch things and be like, that's not true. You can't say that. Um, OK. Oh, I have one little extra line there. If it's unlikely that both samples came from one population, then we assume that our research hypothesis is a better explanation of the data. So you sort of start with the most parsimonious explanation. Oh, there's no effect. There's no difference. Everyone's the same. And only if you've got enough data to say that's a really unlikely explanation do you then move to the less parsimonious one that, oh, there actually is some effect. Right? Does that make sense? Cool. All right, z-scores. This is the beginning of statistics. So the stats that I'm about to present, they follow a very clear logical sequence. And basically what you're doing, well, first two, kind of. Basically what you're going to see happening is you're pulling pieces of information away. Right? So z-score is sort of like best of all possible worlds. Um, a z-score happens when it would happen, for example, with GRE scores would be a good example of a z-score or IQ scores. Or if you ever have your tests actually curve, not when the teacher says, oh, I'm going to give everyone an extra 10 points, but they actually curve them. right? 
they're going to use z-scores. So if you had all the scores in a class, you could say here was the mean, it was 60%, the standard deviation was 10 points or whatever. Um, and what a z-score does is it just standardizes a raw score. And what I mean when I say that is it tells you how many standard deviations a score is off from the mean. So a z-score can be directly interpreted as the number of standard deviations a score is off from the mean, right? And you can see that here mathematically. So if you look at this formula, your z-score is just your raw score, x, minus the mean divided by standard deviation, right? So if the mean's 100, you get a 120 on your IQ test. Standard deviation is 10. Your two standard deviations off the mean, your z-score would be positive 2. Right? If you got an 80, it would be minus 2. I think, again, this is probably, this is like sort of base level. Importantly, a z-score is for one score. Notice that's x and not x bar. Next step up is a z-test. Now, a z-test is used when you have a sample from a population. So you're no longer dealing with a single score. Now you're dealing with a set of scores. Right? But you know the population's mean and standard deviation. And this is really important because this is going to differentiate us from t-tests. So you know that the mean is 100. You know that the standard deviation is 10. But now you have 30 people whose mean IQ score is, say, 120. Right? Does that make sense? So with a z-test, you have to use the what's called the standard error of the mean. Are you guys familiar with standard error? Standard error of the mean is basically the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. I want to explain the basic logic of this. I didn't put a bunch of my slides about sampling distributions because I didn't think we were going to have time. Ooh, we might, but this is perfect. OK. Imagine you have this normal distribution, right? You know all these great things about the normal distribution. You know that the mean is 100, right? You know that your standard deviation is 10. What's the probability, say, that you're going to pull a score of 120 out of that distribution? Just randomly. You, you, you mix them all in a hat. You reach your hand, and you pull out one score, and it's 120. Does anyone know? Probability of pulling a score of 120, mean is 100, standard deviation is 10? Less than 5. Yeah, it's about 5%. Right? That would be a z score of 2. A z score of 2 corresponds to about the 5% level. Right? So you've got about a 1 in 20 chance of pulling a single score out that's 120. Right? That sounded weird. Um, does that make sense? Now, what's the probability that I pull out 10 scores? And the mean of those 10 scores is 120. A lot less. Way less, right? One way to think about it is, what's the probability you pull out one score that's 120? 5%. What's the probability then that you pull out another score that's 120? Also 5%. The Assuming that you put the other one down? Sure, sure. That's, and again, with very large populations, as a, a reasonable assumption. Um, Right. Technically, probabilistically, it's not that easy um, the way I'm painting it. But more or less, they, they multiply. So you have a 5% chance of a 5% chance that you would pull 2. Right? Does this make sense? Probability that you would pull 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. By the time you get to 10, the probability that you would pull 10 scores randomly out of this population is very, very small. Wait, is it 5% of 5% or is it 5% times 5%? They're the same. Are they? Yes. If you have a number and you multiply it times the, the subjective probability, you get the okay. number. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? So you got to correct for this, right? Because if I pull a score out that's 120, I'm like, oh, there's a 5% chance I did that. My z score is going to give me 5%, right? If I pull 10 out, I can't just use the same distribution. I can't use the same sort of logic to reason through it, right? Because it's way more unlikely. I can't say, oh, it's 5%. It's like 0. 0.00000 something percent. It's very, very small. right? So instead, what I have to do is create what's called a sampling distribution. And a sampling distribution, it's sort of like a mental exercise. These things don't, I mean, I guess they could really exist. But they don't generally really exist. The math does it for us. But I just want to walk you through the logic one so you understand sort of what's going on here. So you know you have 10 scores. You know you have this population. And you know you just pulled a mean of 120, right? And you also know that you can't just compare it with the standard deviation you had before, right? So instead, what you do is imagine that you now go back and you pull randomly out of this population, you pull 10 scores out, and you calculate the mean, right? Let's say they have a mean of 101. That would be a likely thing to get. Now you plot that on a new distribution. Do it again. Pull out 10 scores again. Plot that on a new distribution. Do that again. Pull out 10 scores. Plot the mean on a new distribution. 
Do you guys see what I'm doing? Does this make sense when I explain it like this? So you're sampling, and now let's say you do that an infinite number of times. You take all possible samples, and you create this new distribution of sampling means, right? What's that sampling distribution going to look like compared to your original distribution? So, let me put it this way. What if, th th this is the best conceptual way I can think to explain this in the best way that makes sense to me. What if your, s your sample was everyone in the population, right? If you plotted that, what would it look like? Yeah, it would be the normal distribution. It would just be the mean, right? So, so we're plotting the means of the samples? Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry if that was unclear. So, we're pulling the sample, we're calculating the mean of the sample, and then we're plotting that value. Right? And then we do it again and again and again. What's the sampling distribution of these means going to look like compared to our original distribution? Normal? They're not going to be the same, right? Because so in that one, you might have a few, quite a few scores out at 120. But in this new one, we're not going to get many out there, right? Because it would be really unlikely that you're going to get very many samples of 120. So that you can imagine the tails aren't going to be quite as wide, right? And we're going to have a whole lot more right around the mean, right? It's going to go, it's going to get skinnier. So essentially it sucks in. So if this is your distribution, if you take a sample size of two, say, and you plot their means, it's going to suck a little. Sample size of three, suck in more, 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 until the limit, the way that I always think about this, the way you constrain it is if your sample hypothetically was every single person in the population, and you kept doing it and plotting them, what would you get? You just get a straight line, right? It would just go straight up from the mean. Does that make sense? So that sort of pins the two extremes. One is the distribution we started with of all the raw scores. The other extreme is as your sample gets bigger, it comes closer and closer to approximating just a, a distribution of the mean. Does that make sense? So in this example where we pulled a group of 10 out and we got a mean of 120, if we want to know what the probability of that was, we can't compare it to the original distribution, right? We've got to compare it to this new distribution that we made. Does that make sense? I'm seeing confusion. Is that because that's the only one we know? It's because it's, if you compare the mean of 10 scores to a distribution based on single scores, you're comparing apples to oranges. So you have to compare the mean of 10 scores to a distribution of means of groups of 10. Does that make sense? That's a sampling distribution. It's a little bit of a complicated concept, which is why I didn't add a whole bunch in here about it. I just want to give you the gist. The main point is that it's way more unlikely that you're going to pull a group mean at an extreme value than you're going to pull a single score at an extreme value, right? So to correct for that, we use the standard error of the mean instead of the standard deviation. And what the standard error of the mean is, is it's the standard deviation of that sampling distribution that you just built. Does that make sense? Cool. OK. So notice this looks almost exactly the same as a z-score. Right? You'll notice there's two differences. One is that x bar there, that's the mean of our sample rather than an individual score, minus the mean of our population. And you'll notice down at the bottom, you see the standard deviation symbol, but it has the little subscript of x bar. That's because it's the standard error of the mean. This is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution as opposed to the standard deviation of just the population. Does that make sense? And again, sampling distributions, to a large extent, you can actually construct them. I mean, you could write a computer program that could do this a million times and give you an actual sampling distribution. There's actually cool software online that will do this for you if you want to know more about <coughs> it. Um, but we don't have to do that, because hypothetically, we can do it with this math equation right here. All this does is correct for the fact that we have a sample size of n. Oh, it should be little n. Doesn't matter though. Um, all that this does is correct for the fact that we're not looking at one score. We're looking at the mean of a group of n scores. This right here gives us the standard deviation of the distribution we should actually compare that to. Otherwise, everything's exactly the same. Does that make sense? So the fundamental difference between a z score in a z-test is with a z-score, you're using an individual score, and you're using the standard deviation of the whole population. 
with a z-test, you're using the mean of a sample of scores and the standard error of the mean, which you have to use because that's the standard deviation of the, the distribution that it sort of belongs to. Does that make sense? Say that one more time. Um, you have to do the equation on the test yes. first and then compute. Yes. So notice here, all you need to know is the population mean, which is in our z-test formula. You need to know your sample mean, which is in our z-test formula. You need to know the, the population standard deviation. And you just need to know what your sample size was. I pulled out 10 people, or I pulled out 5 people, or whatever. Does that make sense? It's the exact same thing. It's just you're comparing a group rather than a single individual. Cool. So this is important because from here, I'm going to start pulling pieces of information away. And this is the only difference between the t-test and the z-test. You guys ready? Everyone, you feel like you got the z-test stuff down? Okay. So the next one, and probably one of the more common types of statistics you'll see if you're reading journal articles and stuff, is a t-test. The simplest and easiest t-test is a single sample t-test. You use a single sample t-test when the null hypothesis's population mean is known, but not the population standard deviation. So for example, let's say that I knew that the mean of the United States and IQ scores was 100, but I didn't know what the standard deviation was. For some reason, I didn't have all of them, or who knows, the paper got lost, who knows, right? What do you guys think you might do in such a situation? So we've got this circumstance. We're pulling these guys out, right? We know we have our sample. We can measure things in our sample, but we don't know this important piece of information that we need about the population. What do you think you might do? Run the screen. You could do that. Estimate. Yeah, you could estimate it, right? Assuming that our, that our sample isn't that different from our population, the mean might be different, right? That's what we're testing. But probably the variance is about the same, right? It's an assumption, right? We don't know. But if you're in this situation, we're going to have to estimate if we want to do the same types of, of, of tests, right? So the population standard deviation is estimated from the sample standard deviation. Which, by the way, maybe a few of you are perking up. That sounds like kind of risky business, right? How do you know? How do you know that the population Standard deviation is anywhere near the sample standard deviation. Um, the first answer is you don't. It's an assumption. Um, but the sort of better answer is the t-tests are just less sensitive, right? More or less, the math tries to take account for the fact that you don't actually know it. It tries to say, OK, you're estimating something, so you now have more noise in what you're doing, right? Therefore, we're going to make it even harder for you to get these improbable estimates. Does that make sense? The statistics sort of take that into account, is all I'm trying to say. So in order to do this, you'll notice this equation looks just like the last one, except for now rather than sigma at the bottom, the standard error of the mean of the population, you'll notice there's an S. Right? The reason for that is because we're now going to use the standard deviation of our sample to estimate the standard deviation of our population. So S here is, I mean, you, I don't want to say it's the standard deviation of the sample, because it's not quite right. S is our estimated standard deviation of the population from the standard deviation of our sample. Yes? Why wouldn't this be a case where you would know the population mean, but not the standard deviation? One, so one really good case comes up here in a minute. And would be, so it would be weird, right? It would be kind of weird, and this isn't all that common in research that you see the single sample. Um, I don't know of any example off the top of my head where, where something like this would be the case. Um, one place where I can't think that it happens is in parallel sample t-test, which is you give someone a test, you give them a cup of coffee, and then you give them a post-test. And you want to know, did the coffee help them, right? In a within subjects design, if the coffee didn't help them, you would imagine that the difference between pretest and post-test on average would be zero, right? In that case, when you're using different scores like that, the difference between one and another within a subject, 
the population mu is zero. So you know the population is mu is zero by assumption because that's what it would be if there were no effect, which is your normal hypothesis. Is that clear? I know it's sort of a convoluted roundabout explanation, but that's one specific case I can imagine this happening. I, I mean, top of my head, we don't generally do t-tests anyways. You run ANOVAs and stuff. Um, but it helps because what this does is it's a stepping stone to where we want to get, which is independent samples t-tests, which is what you more generally would use anyways. So, right. So the difference here, again, don't worry about all the math. I don't want you guys worrying about the math. It's not a huge deal. The main thing I would point out here is just like with the z-tests, notice how we calculate standard error of the mean is just standard deviation of our population divided by the sample, square root of the sample size, right? We're doing the same thing here, but we're using the standard deviation. So if you look at the second equation in, we're using the standard deviation of our sample divided by our sample size. So it's the same basic calculation. And you might notice too, if you follow it to the next one, that that expands out into the same basic formula with which we calculated variance, well, standard deviation in the population, right? You guys see the difference? What's the difference between this and how we did it for a population? What's the difference between how you calculate SX? What? Minus one. Yeah, you guys all see that N minus one in the denominator? If it were sigma for the population, that's just an N. The whole point of that, well, there's a couple of reasons for it. Just think about it this way. We have to do that to correct for the fact that it's just an estimate that we didn't actually know the right value. Does that make sense? Again, you don't have to know the formula, but I just want you to see that they're basically the same, but you have to sort of do these little tricks as you start estimating more things. Is everyone clear on the single sample? Just like a z-test, except we have to estimate the population standard deviation because we don't have it. All right, ready? Here we go. This is the one you actually will see a lot more. Single sample, yeah, it's like a toy test. I can't, I can't imagine a, a situation where I've actually seen one done, except for in stats class. Um, but it helps to build up the logic for this next one, which is the independent samples. So you use independent samples when neither the null hypothesized population mean or standard deviation is known. I put that in brackets. I feel like it's kind of awkward, the null hypothesis's population mean, only because I'm saying the population under the null hypothesis of sort of what we're imagining it to be, right? If you don't know the mean or the standard deviation, which would have been the case in our earlier example of depressed people with Prozac, depressed people without Prozac, we wouldn't actually know the mean of that population of depressed people without Prozac. So hypothetically, we wouldn't know that, right? So we'd have to estimate it. Okay, what do you think your best way to estimate some population mean is if you don't know it. This was in an earlier slide. I mentioned it would come back up. I don't know on average how happy depressed people are. I don't have access to the population of depressed people. What should I do? Take the mean of the sample. Yeah, absolutely. Pull out what I think is a representative sample. Calculate the mean of that sample. The mean of that sample is going to be our best guess for the mean of the population. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So the mean is estimated from a control group, right? However, the standard deviation is actually estimated from the standard deviation of both samples. Unless you have some reason to believe that your two samples are going to have really different variants, or if you observe it, you measure them, you're like, oh my god, that's 10 times the variance of the other one. So I told you this could be an issue, right? The standard deviation thing can become an issue because right here, you don't want to estimate the standard deviation just from your control group because you actually have more information. You can get a better estimate than just the, the estimate from the control group, right? You can get the estimates from both groups as long as we think that the population is spread out more or less the same as the samples are spread out. So you don't want to throw that information away. You want to sort of just lump them together. So the only difference here between the last one, there's two differences. One is notice that mu is now replaced by the mean of group two, your control group, right? And notice that in the bottom we have S pool. S pool, oh, that should be standard error pool. That's an error in the slides, that's okay. S pooled roughly, so. This is not the right formula. That should be standard error pooled. 
but S pooled variance is calculated by basically crunching together the variance from both of your samples. Does that make sense? Okay. An independent sample that though it's totally agnostic on within versus between subjects. Well, it's a between subjects design. Um, so you can imagine like with this class, I want to know how fast, how many people can, how many apples you can eat, or how many oranges you can eat in an hour. And so one thing I do is like, all right, everyone in this class, come in today. You have an hour. Go. See how many oranges they can get. They come in the next day, exact same people. How many more, how many apples can you get? Go. Versus I have this class do apples and then that class do oranges. And so when I'm wanting to make the comparison, that's a within a between subjects versus the within subject. So if it were a within subject mm -hmm. comparison, you would use a paired samples okay. t test. If it were a between subjects comparison, you would use the independent samples t test. And if you wanted to do some weird amalgamation of both, you have to do a mixed model ANOVA. Which we're going to come to. Yes. The paired samples. If you if you if you want to compare within samples, so like pre-test, post-test, but it's the same person taking the test. That's a paired samples t-test, which is coming up on the next slide. If you want to compare between two groups, so one group of people takes pre-test, one group of people takes post-test, that's independent samples t-test. And if you want to do some weird in-between thing, like I want to see one group of people takes both pretest and post test, and then another group takes some other test. That's what's called a mixed model ANOVA, which just means it's mixed model because it's between and within, sort of jammed into the same um, test. Okay. We're going to cover that also. So, so with the apples and oranges, you guys do apples, they do yep. oranges, see if there's a difference, independent samples. Up to this point, yeah. all that we've done is comparing groups like that. Either you're comparing a group to a known population or you're comparing two groups to each other. We haven't yet compared people to themselves. However, it's a great lead in to uh, paired samples t-test. Also known as a dependent samples t-test or within subjects t-test. What it means that it's dependent samples, right? Paired samples is pretty clear that, that if you, each person takes both measures Right, like a pretest and post test. Like I gave you guys all tests when you walked into class today, and then I give you a test when you walk out of class today. Right? I can pair all those up because it's not as though you need to compare the pretest and the post test scores. You can compare how people are doing relative to themselves, right? Later. It's called dependent samples because if you did poorly on the pretest, you're probably going to do poorly on the post test, or at least more so than average. If you did better on the pretest, you'll probably do better on the post test, more so than average. So they depend upon each other. They're not independent measures. Within subjects, it just means that you're measuring things within one person rather than between two people. Right? Does this make sense? Paired samples t-tests are cool. Um, the reason I saved them for the end, sometimes uh, they introduce these before the independent samples t-tests. But I wanted to put them in, the, in at the end because the other ones sort of build up in this real logical way of like, oh, you lost that piece of information and you lost this piece of information. Paired samples, it's not about losing information per se. And in fact, as I mentioned before, you know the population mean because you're looking at different scores. What's the difference of people from one step to the next? And so if there's no difference, then the mean would be zero, right? So this is sort of its own weird thing. It says off to the side because it's a within subjects design. But basically, all it is is a single sample, single sample t-test, but you use different scores rather than raw scores. All that a different score is is subtract your pretest from your post-test. It's the difference between the two tests for you. Does that make sense? But the math is the same, and I'm going to show you here this, show this to you here in just a second. The difference score is calculated by subtracting each subject score in one item, such as a post-test, from that subject score in another item, such as a pretest. Right? That's it backwards, uh, maybe from what it should be, but it doesn't really matter. It's just that you're looking across things and saying, what's the difference between the two? So we're sort of canceling out all the noise. So if you came in and you got a 7 on the test, and then you left and you got a 9 on the test, you got a different score of 2, right? Someone else comes in and they get a 3 on the test, and they walk out and they got a 5 on the test. It's also a difference of 2. So you, you got an equivalent gain. These are also called gain scores. You got an equivalent gain from the class, even though one of you was better on both tests than the other one was on, on either, right? Does that make sense? So it's a way of sort of eliminating that between subject noise. You may just be better at taking tests than I am, right? Well, if I use this type of design, that washes out because all we're looking at is how you're improving rather than 
individual differences that characterize us. This is important and the reason I'm mentioning this is because within subjects designs in which you compare people to themselves, methodologically can be problematic, right? If I gave you the exact same test at the end that I gave you at the beginning, you might just remember all the answers, right? So in that sense, it can be problematic. But when you can avoid problems like that, within subjects designs are always much more powerful than between subjects because you can ignore all of the other factors that contribute to differences, right? So maybe I didn't sleep last night because I had the flu and you did, and so you're gonna ace the test and I'm not, right? Between subjects, that looks exactly the same as though you just did better on the test. Between subjects can't differentiate all these sort of extraneous causes of things versus what we want to focus on as the cause. Within subjects allow you to do that because you can ignore the sort of individual differences between people. That three to five person was just worse at taking tests than the seven to nine person, but they both are treated the same in a within subjects because they both gain two points. Does this make sense? It's sort of a deep point about methodological design. Within subjects designs, if you can pull them off and justify them, always better, always better. You can show in a within subjects design with like a quarter of the people what you can show in a between subjects because you just get a cleaner signal coming through. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the signal noise stuff here in a little bit. Here's the formula. That D, notice that D bar right there. The D bar is similar to the X bar that you saw in the, um, in the uh, single sample C test but it's different scores, right? So I take everyone's post-test score, I subtract their pre-test score, I get a whole bunch of D scores for every person, right? So you have, you have score one and you have score two, but then I just subtract them and give you just one score. And that's your score, your gain score, right? Now again, if I'm comparing that sample to a population, right? So then I take the mean, I get everyone's mean. Um, some of you go plus, some of you go minus. If there were no effect of the class, if I completely failed today at teaching you guys anything, and so your post-test scores were exactly the same as your pre-test scores, just by random chance, some of you might get an extra question right, some of you might miss an extra question, right? Some would have positive gain scores, some would have negative gain scores. When I summed them all up and took the average, the average should be zero, right, if there's no effect. So the population mean of a different score population is zero by assumption. You guys all see that plugged in over there? It's zero by assumption because it's zero if there's no effect, which is our null hypothesis, right? And so what this tells us is, what's the probability that there was no effect, right? And notice that SD at the bottom, at, but at this point you guys are probably at least familiar enough to, to realize where that's coming from. That's the variance of the, the different scores. So again, in the same way that to compare a sample to a population, we had to create a sampling distribution. Here we have to create a different score sampling distribution, right? Because I, I took all of your one scores and your two scores and I turned it into a totally different score, this gain score. That's now our population. And that's what the D subscript reflects. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, well, the, the slides, you, you'll have the slides at home. So. Um, they don't have notes on them. I, I don't like the little notes at the bottom. I always get distracted. Um, but they're posted on your guys' website. And if you have any questions, um, textbooks will go through this in incredible rigor. Like to the point where I think sometimes they're not helpful. Um, and I'm trying to extract all of that extra stuff from there and just give you this is all it is without giving you all the extra sort of bells and whistles on it. Yeah. I don't know, we use Howl in our class. All statistics textbooks have strengths and weaknesses. There's ne I've never seen one that I was like, yeah, that's the one. And I've, I've read probably five or six of them. Um, the best thing I've actually found is on YouTube. It's, it's this thing called Khan Academy. Oh yeah, Khan Academy is awesome. And it's this guy who like, he's this teacher, he's like got all this money to like make these online tutorials. And he goes through like sampling distribution. Like we were talking about that thing about when you sample a bunch of things, will it look like the population? And everyone intuitively is like, yeah, they'll match. And like they don't, and he like shows you why, and Z scores. And like when I didn't understand things, I would just sit there and watch it on YouTube. And it's really awesome, Michael, that's super helpful. By the way, 
on that note, if you guys ever just want free educational stuff, the internet has so many awesome things. I don't know if you guys ever use iTunes U. You guys ever heard of that? You can go on there and like right now my iPod, I've got a, some Yale professor lecturing on evolution. You can just get free classes. And they're really helpful if you're self-motivated to learn. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, there's even a cool resource here. Um, my friend put together a website called finalsclub.org where they try to get Harvard students to blog their classes. So you can go on there and find lots of blogs of different classes going on here. You've got iTunes U, MIT OpenCourseWare, Yale OpenCourseWare. On the internet, it's finally happening where you can get like free top-notch information like this. So I think that's a great, and I've heard one, I've never used the Khan Academy, but I've heard wonderful things about it. So thanks, Michael. Um, cool, okay, so that breaks a natural sort of section, because now we're gonna go to ANOVAs. You guys need a break, you guys cool? You wanna keep cruising? Awesome, okay. So any questions about Z-tests, T-tests? Okay, now we're going to the next level. So up to this point, we've compared at most two groups, right? Or group one to group two. Um, or one score to a population or something along those lines. What ANOVA does, ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. Um, what it does is it allows you to compare more than two groups on some independent variable, or on some dependent variable. So for example, using this last analysis, right? It would be easy to, com the, the analyses we've seen so far, it'd be easy to compare, say, men and women, right? But how would you compare different ethnic groups? You could do a whole bunch of them, right? But you couldn't sort of do them all at once. That's what ANOVA allows us to do. By the way, I don't, hopefully this isn't confusing at all, but it should be stated that while this comes up as sort of a new topic, and it is a different thing because it allows us to do more stuff, ANOVAs and T-tests are actually the same thing. If you ran an ANOVA with only two groups, you get what's called an F value. If you took, the F is T squared, yes. If you took the square root of that F value, it would be the exact same as if you ran the equivalent T test as the T value. And the reason for that, well, yeah, I'll, I can mention, I think that's fine. The reason why it's the square root, why the F gives you the T squared, roughly, I could do the proof, but you guys don't want to see it. Um, check out Khan Academy. <laughs> Um, the reason for that is because you'll notice that these t-tests were using difference between means and they're using the standard deviation, right? So you're asking how many standard deviations are these things off from each other? But you remember the standard deviation is the square root of variance? You guys remember that from the earlier slide? ANOVA works directly off of variance. So think of it this way. Z-tests, t-tests, z-scores work off of standard deviations. ANOVAs work off of variance, right? Variance is standard deviation squared, F is T squared. Of course, you can't get T values for comparing more than two groups, but in that special case where you, you were running an ANOVA and you could have run a T-test, it's the same exact thing. You're not doing anything different. The math will look different, but it's the same once you get under the hood. So in a one-way ANOVA, you're using one categorical independent variable with more than two levels. Notice that I brought back the measurement here. The reason I say it's categorical is because you can't do this if you have, say, an interval independent variable. That's not true. You can do it with an interval independent variable, but you have to break it into categories. Because you're asking about different groups, right? So you can't have a group that's on a scale. It's not like one group can fade into another group. You're asking about discrete groups. Are these three groups different from each other? If I give you Prozac versus not give you Prozac versus give you coffee, right? Those are discrete categories. If you were to do this with a continuous variable, how much Prozac do I give you and how well do you feel? You can either break that into groups and run ANOVA or you can do it in regression, which we're gonna come to. But it's just important to realize that your independent variables here are categorical and your dependent variables are the ones you wanna be interval. And if you think about it, that's actually the case for all the T-tests and Z-tests stuff we just did, right? I didn't explicitly say it because we were just talking about two groups. But here we're talking about multiple groups, but it's an independent variable, right? So before it was, like, it was like group membership was the independent variable, but now you can think of the independent variable as say, state that you live in. You could compare 50 groups, right? Does that make sense? Okay, you can do stuff with interval ratio independent variables, uh, but generally you wanna do that in regression. 
And then to do this, you want the categorical independent variable in one or two levels and an interval level dependent variable. This is why, remember I said it's really important how you measure these things. You can't run ANOVA if you've got nominal data. I guess you could if it was ordinal. I wouldn't do it. You want interval level data. Um, I think you can get around some of these other things and if you really know what you're doing. I don't know enough to do it. Um, I think there are some kinds of workarounds you can do, but um, I wouldn't mess with it if you don't know well what you're doing. Um, so this tests what's called the omnibus null hypothesis. Right? So before we were comparing, is group one the same as group two? Now we're asking, is group one the same as group two, the same as group three, the same as group four, same as group five? And all that it tests, the ANOVA itself, all that it tests is whether or not they're all the same or whether or not they're not all the same. And now you may notice, well, I didn't care about whether two and three were different. I just want to know if one was different from two and three, right? I just want to know if one stuck out from the group. In order to test those specific hypotheses, rather than just, oh, they're all different, but to say, like, oh, one's actually different than two, you do what are called post hoc tests or what are called contrasts. I don't have time to get into it. Um, it. There's whole literature on these things, but this allows you to make, to ask more specific questions like, is mean one greater than mean two, right? Um, rather than just, are they all the same or not? Um, and there, again, there's a whole bunch of stuff to go along with this, so I can't really get too much into it. Um, but just be aware that the way that you do that is with contrast and post hoc tests. Post hoc tests are basically, they're generally just independent samples t tests for all the different comparisons, and they do some correction. Um, for the fact they're doing a whole bunch of them. Okay, so one way ANOVA. Basically, the logic of how this works is like this. In the same way that I've been talking about estimating what's going on in the population, let's say you've got three samples, right? And you want to know, do they all come from this one population or not? How would you estimate the variance of that population? How much would you expect scores to vary from the population? Similar to how we did the independent samples t-test, we want to use the variance from within all of our groups, right? If all of these three groups kind of look the same, they all have similar spread, they all have similar dispersion, similar distributions, we should take all that information somehow and say that's probably what the population looks like, right? In other words, if you think of the population as just one group, they all vary for all of these reasons, these random reasons. I woke up late today, you didn't have coffee this morning, you're feeling great, whatever. There's always sort of random variations, right? I grew up West Coast, you grew up, it doesn't really matter. But that's random variance because it's not systematically connected to anything that we're concerned with. If you want to know if Prozac works and I'm happier today because my mom is visiting, right? That's irrelevant to the question of whether or not Prozac works. Right? It's random. And it's random because it only applies to me and has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Whereas for you, it might be that you grew up in, you know, California, and that's totally different. Or it could be, you know, that you've had a rough day, and that's totally different. So it's random variance, so it's how things are varying just randomly due to sort of chance circumstances. Right? And the amount of variance you see within these samples is a pretty good estimate of how much in general that, that happens, right? Because these samples, you're assuming they're all the same. One of them I gave Prozac, one of them I didn't, one of them I gave coffee. The amount that they're all varying naturally within themselves is a pretty good estimate for how much the population should be varying naturally within itself, right? Does that make sense? So the way you say that is that this within group variance of these samples gives you an estimate of the random variance of your population. Does that make sense? Here we go, next step. The between group variance, so the difference between the means. The placebo, the, the placebo group is at one, the coffee group is at three, and the Prozac group is at 10. That one, three, 10 difference in means, you can use that to then calculate between group variance, right? There's some tricky math that has to be done to get a good estimate of this. And I'm gonna come back to that here in a minute. Um, yeah, I'm gonna set that aside for now and just mention the reason why you're gonna see between group variance is both random, right? If you have one population and you take three samples out of that population, just randomly, the means are gonna be a little bit different, right? You might get one, two, and 0.5, right? Just randomly. So it's both that random variance that's there, but it's also the systematic variance of, oh, I gave them Prozac, I gave them coffee, and I didn't give them anything, right? 
So the systematic variance means it's tracking your variable. And the random variance means it's just these noise factors. My mom's in town. You're having a bad day. You're you know, sick or whatever. Does that make sense? So within group variance, Within these samples, it gives you an estimate of the random variance from the population. The between group variance tells you both the systematic variance between your samples, as well as the random variance in the population. Does that make sense? Just systematic. Systematic. And systematic just means it's sort of all going in one direction, right? So random variance, like in, in physics, you would talk about random variance as just, if we all just jumped up and just started running around in circles, that would be random variance. If we jumped up and started running in circles and there was a strong wind going that way, we'd all sort of slowly move in that way. So you'd have both the random variance of us just running around, but you'd have the systematic variance of us sort of slightly going this way eventually. That's how it's, that's a rough description of the mathematical uh, formalism, I guess. Okay, so all that an ANOVA does is it compares these two. And I'm going to go through three different ways, wait, one, two, yeah, three different ways of thinking about this comparison. There's a whole bunch of different ways to conceptualize what an ANOVA is doing. Hopefully, just one of them will stick. Um, if they all stick, awesome. They're all completely equivalent to each other. It's just different framings, OK? So what this does is it compares the variance between the different groups to the variance within the groups. Boom. That's our F ratio right there. You get an F statistic rather than a T statistic or a Z statistic. You look it up in an F table rather than a T table or a Z table. But it's the same basic idea. Right? Does that make sense? So I'm going to give you a couple extra ways to think about this. Hopefully these are helpful. Pulling from information theory, you can think about this as signal and noise. Right? So in the example I just gave, if we all jumped up, right? I give everyone coffee and we all jump up and we freak out and we're just running around in circles. That's just noise. Right? It's just random variance. Think of it as white noise on your TV. Right? But then if a strong breeze starts coming, I mean like real strong wind, we don't sort of start moving that way, pretend that wall's not there. That's the systematic variance, that's our signal, right? That's the signal of the wind. Another way of thinking about it is that if you're looking at a whole set of information, right? Within that information, there's going to be a bunch of noise that you don't care about. Things are just randomly going to be kind of all over the place. But there might also be a signal, right? In that noise. And this compares the ratio of the signal plus the noise to just the noise itself. Let me try and push this one step further and say this is what happens when you tune your radio. You know when you're in between stations and it goes That's noise. And when you hit the radio station, what's happening is the, there's a capacitor in there that pulls the signal out of the noise. That noise is still there. In fact, all the radio stations are always still there. Wherever you are, all it's doing is amplifying that signal to drown out the noise. Why don't we just cancel out the noise and just like... Oh, you mean mathematically? Like, no, why can't I just do that? Imagine it's like what we're doing is just measuring the, ra the ratio of the signal basically to the noise. Like, I feel like, the, I don't know, I'm just, I never understand why we can't just that, measure degree cancel it out. That's more or less kind of what you're trying to do. If you think about it, there's no possible way you could ever measure the pure signal without also measuring noise. There's no way I can't, well, I mean, that's not totally true, but in general, especially in social science, there's no way you can just get the signal. What's the effect of Prozac? Well, I don't know. I can just give it to people and see what happens. So there's always going to be noise there. And so you, you, you are, in essence, trying to do that. But you can just inevitably have to factor it in. You're trying to take your signal plus noise, the only thing you can measure, and then get an estimate of your noise so you can sort of cancel it out and say, oh, I, that part's accounted for, and we've got something way beyond that. Okay. That is, in essence, what you're doing, actually. That's a good way of putting it. Is that an, a, another? Again, I told you there's like four different ways you can think about this. All right, here comes the next one. Are you guys ready? It also compares expected to observed, right? Noise is the expected amount of variance that we're going to see by chance, right? Signal plus noise is the amount that we actually observe. If those observations are about the same, your F ratio is about 1. By the way, no result corresponds to an F ratio of 1. So if you think about what that would mean in these two equations here, that mean observed is exactly what we'd expect just from noise, right? If you think about the one up above, if there's zero signal, you would just have noise over noise, it would also equal one. F ratios of one are basically nothing is going on. Takes an F ratio of about four to get statistical significance. Okay, does this make sense? So, yes. You know
Sure. Yeah, let's say work and let's say let's say work and program and I give the next class Prozac, right? right? right. And you ask us how happy we all are right now? Right. I guarantee we're not all gonna be equally happy. You guys are listening to this boring lecture, maybe some of you guys like it more, some of you guys like it less. There's gonna be variance within us, but it's not systematic, it's just randomly, right? Right. Exactly. So if we measured them before we gave them Prozac, right. they would also be noisy. Right. And then we give them Prozac. You can imagine measuring us is to get an estimate of what that noise is. Yeah, roughly. Roughly. When you're doing AIDS. That, it's one, again, it's one way to think about it. Another way is you could think about us is what's the expected variance? And then look at them and say, okay, what's the observed sort of variance between us? And are those the same, or, are the, or is the observed actually much greater than we would have expected to see by chance? If it is a lot greater than we'd expect to see by chance, then we say it's unlikely that they're the same, and therefore we provide support for our research hypothesis. All right, here we go. This is the intermediate ANOVA logic. That last one, that's sort of like basic ANOVA logic. This is one. Actually, we just had this in our class. It's very cool. Um, another way of thinking about this is it compares the ratio of this sort of hypothetical populations that these samples are likely to have come from. Stick with me. You've got your F ratio, right? Now you know you can measure, let's say you've got these three groups, one's a one, one's a three, and one's a 10, right? Now you can measure, just like you can measure variance, you can measure variance between these groups and the overall, right? So the average of those, maybe I should do something easy, maybe let's say two, four, six, right? I can measure the variance of those as the difference of each group mean off of the grand mean, right? 2 minus 4, 4 minus 4, 6 minus 4, square them, divide by n. Right, you guys follow me? So calculate the, treat the, each of the samples as though they were sort of like a person, and then calculate the variance, right? However, we also know from that same logic of building up the sampling distribution that we'd have to work backwards, right? If we're dealing with means, we now have to sort of unravel those means and then build a likely population out of them. Does that make sense? And when you do that, maybe you're going to see something like this. So you build this up and you say, okay, we don't really know what this population looks like, but this is a probable estimate of what the population might look like, such that we would randomly draw these three groups by chance, right? So if the groups are, you know, 1, 3, and 10, that would have to be a pretty widely dispersed population if they're samples of, say, 10 people, right? Because to get a sample of 1, 3, and 10, I mean, the standard deviation of that would have to be very large for that to be a probable outcome. Does that make sense? So if that's what we observe, we can say, well, that must have come from this very spread out population, right? Let's call that population between. And then we could say, what would the population likely have looked like from a within sample variance. So if you just look at how individuals are varying from each other, not based on group membership, what would that have looked like? And you could say, oh, the population probably looks something like this. It's likely for them to have come out of this smaller population. This is, by the way, assuming that there's some sort of an effect. And then what you do is you compare the ratio of those two. And if that ratio, if they look like they're more or less the same, Oh, the likely distribution from these b this between measure variance and the likely distribution from this within measure variance, they're basically the same. You can say all we're seeing is stuff by chance, right? Again, it's that signal and noise. There is no signal. If those two looked identical, there would be no signal. Here there's a signal. I don't know. Maybe it's, I tried to make it four times, but I wasn't very good with the PowerPoint graphics, so maybe it's like three times. Your F ratio might be three here. But that's another way of thinking about it, of sort of working backwards and saying, what would this likely have come from? And what would this likely have come from? And if those are the same, there's no signal. If those are very different, there is a signal. Does that make sense? You guys got it? Feeling good about the ANOVA? This is, again, it's more important to get the gist of these, these are sort of high level explanations, and they take a little digesting. It's not like you just get one day. Okay. Um, a factorial ANOVA. So a factorial ANOVA, I'm not going to go a whole lot into the math here because you don't really need to know it. Um, main thing you need to know is when you have low to low categorical independent